I had worked in watercolor for many years. I was painting my organic garden when we lived in western Pennsylvania. We lived on 51 acres and I had this organic garden that I spent an incredible amount of time on. It was a huge garden and it was my palette and my inspiration for all of my paintings pretty much in that period. And uh, I decided I was very attracted to oils, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with them. So I started playing around with them, and they just seemed like these big, you know, working in the a la prima method, big globs of oil just didn't work for me. I was so used to all these delicate, many, many, many layers of glazing and the watercolors. So I was in New York, and I was at the Frick Museum and I saw this beautiful painting called St. Francis in the Garden by Giovanni Bellini, and it was just the most luminous painting I'd ever seen in my life. And I said, I have to find out how he did that. It was oil over egg tempera. So I tracked down, making many phone calls to New York and other places, I tracked down a man named Carlos Madrid who was teaching this technique. There aren't many people teaching it or doing this technique anymore and went and studied with him for four months in New York. And that's how I learned the technique, but then I've definitely taken it my own direction. I work with all these layers of oil glaze, and many times, uh, actually usually, as I'm applying all these underglazes before I start developing the detail, they'll, the detail will be, become more and more obscured. When I do the underpainting of the egg tempera, uh, there's a very detailed drawing that's underneath. There's a lot of preparation and thought that goes into a painting that I have to think about before I even start painting in order to work in this technique. But then as I start laying in the oil glazes, it, they get more and more obscured. It's under many, many layers of, that are kind of generic, just layers of color, one building on top of the other. Towards the end of the painting, pulling the detail back out to recreate it from the oil glazes. So it's a very long process and it's like there's a very close focus. And if you look very closely at some of them, you can still see, and I'm allowing this to happen more and more, which is to leave some of the white egg tempera is actually visible. You can see the cross hatching. It's a cross hatching technique. And you can see it emerging out of the layers of glaze if you look real closely at the painting. There have been a few paintings, one called The Feast, where I, the, oil, I, the underpainting itself took me a month just to do the egg tempera part of the underpainting. And it was so beautiful that I didn't really, I wasn't sure that I wanted to continue and put the oil glazes on top, but I knew that the colors were gonna be so rich and so beautiful, and that, that painting is a still life with macaws and the, just such a variety of colors that I knew that I had to do it even though I hated to cover up that underpainting because it really was very beautiful on its own. When I was in elementary school, one of my favorite uh, art lessons, the teacher would have all these scraps of colored paper that were left over from our projects and she would save them all in a box. And on a certain day, she would pull them all out and go around the room and we would pick a shape out of the box and then we would glue the shape to a piece of paper and we would create some kind of picture around utilizing that shape. And that was just one of my absolute most favorite projects in school. I still remember and there's very few specific projects, art projects that I remember. And in a funny way, I think I'm kind of doing that now. I love beautiful shapes and I'm working out the, everything around these shapes in my paintings, uh, especially when I work with the gold leaf because I'll put it in all different kinds of patterns in the paintings and then work around them. For instance, in tapestry, sea grapes and lorikeets, it was like this exercise in working around these shapes that were created in gold leaf. The person that does my framing taught me how to do gold, gold leafing, water gilding, which is a very old process. Uh, and has to be done very delicately. I have to close all the windows and not have the air conditioning on because the gold leaf comes in these very, very thin sheets of 22 karat gold and just even the slightest breath will crumple it up and it'll ball up into nothing pretty much, just down to gold powder or whatever. And uh, it's a very delicate process. But I've been able to use the gold as, as an abstract element in my paintings. 
I, when I first started using it, it was very intimidating, and the first painting I used it in was called Dancing in the Light, and I had it in the side panels, but not actually in the body of the painting. And then when I got more confident with using it as an abstract element, it started to be in the actual paintings. But if you look closely at my gold, there's lots of scratches and imperfections and all kinds of things in it. And, I, and uh, part of it is <laughs> I'm not very good at applying the gold, but the other part is that I really love all the little accidents that happen with working with it very loosely instead of trying to totally control this very delicate gold. And I started getting a little better at it, and it started looking too perfect for the paintings. I really want this feeling of, of um, all different shapes and, and fissures in the gold and all kinds of things which become a part of the surface of the painting. So I don't want it looking as perfect as someone would use it, for instance, for a gold leaf frame or whatever. It becomes an abstract element of the painting, just like those shapes in elementary school. I was speaking to a gallery director in New York and he was interested in seeing my work and I brought it, they also had a gallery at the time in DC, now I believe they're in New York and Chicago. And they, show, they started showing, had started out with showing American art, dead artists, and had started a contemporary division to the gallery. Uh, and I brought the work in and it was very interesting because they show beautiful realist work, but when my work was next to the realists that they show. It was so different than the work they were showing and we hadn't even realized it. I was working in watercolor at the time and I thought of myself as a, a, a realist, but when I saw it next to the other realist work, it's so much more contemporary looking than traditional realism and so much more bold that it wasn't in keeping at all with the kind of work that they showed. And that was when I realized how almost surreal my work is in comparison. And you know, I know that people would probably think of me as a realist, but when you see my work next to traditional realism, it has a very different feeling to it. Maybe more magical realism or something. I'm always interested in people's responses to my work and what they pull out of it, and I'd rather have them respond to what it is for them than me tell them exactly what it is for me for two reasons. A lot of times I'm not even exactly sure. Uh, sometimes later I am, sometimes I'm not. And also because I think that's what art's about, is what it is for the viewer and what it pulls out in their subconscious. And I had a friend that was staying with me that was an artist. And as I say, I was painting in my garden and everything was looking down onto this bed of straw. And she had this dream of sleeping on a bed of straw which had been provoked by seeing my painting. I had another woman that came to my show in Vero Beach, at the Vero Beach Museum of Art. She was there at the last day of my show, and uh, as they were getting ready to take it down, and she said it just made her want to cry, and she asked them if she could just sit on the floor in the middle of the room. And she, she, it was interesting because she said she could tell that all that beauty had come from a lot of pain inside of the artist, and I just thought that was incredibly perceptive because a lot of times when people see my paintings, they just think I've been this incredibly happy person and actually, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that have happened in my life and a lot of things that I'm working on in myself all the time that are part of what the painting is about for me. It's a transformative process. So I really appreciated her seeing that in my work and obviously it touched something in her too. I don't think you can respond to what the artist is doing in that way and not have it come back to the viewer in some way, to their experience and what it, what it brings up in them about their own experience of light, life. And um, I, that, I mean, that really means a lot to me because, you know, people will say, well, here you spent two to six months on a painting, how can you let go of them? But if I didn't sell them and put them out in the world, then I would have this house with no room to even live in because my studio and my home would be so full of paintings and I love that interchange of having the work go out and other people experience it and live with it and and their own stories come up because of living with my work so that's very very important to me and I think it 
it is to most artists that the, that that communication with the world that's what art is about is communicating the internal with the outside world in some way.